This is Jack Kenny, and you are watching the TV Writer Podcast. Seven, six, five, four. We have main engine start. Two, one. Booster ignition and liftoff. Countdown to launch. Stall TV 2010 on the TV Writer Podcast, partner of Script Magazine. Hosted by Gray Jones, the TV Writer Podcast is brought to you by Script Magazine and ScriptMag.com, the leading source for script writing information in print and on the web. And by Final Draft Script Writing Software, the entertainment industry standard for script writing worldwide. I want to welcome you to the TV Writer Podcast, partner of Script Magazine, episode number two for Monday, August 30th, 2010. This is part one of our series on the crossover between sci-fi shows Warehouse 13 and Eureka. This is a video podcast. I want to remind you that you can access it at tvwriterpodcast.com, tvwriterpodcast.blip.tv, or at scriptmag.com. And also you can get it on iTunes. Just do a search for TV Writer Podcast. There is a video version that is enhanced with some images from the shows that we talk about. And also you get to see my lovely mug. And also, um, you can access it in an audio-only form by the scriptmag.com site and also through the Script Magazine iTunes account. But today we're talking about Warehouse 13. Warehouse 13 is actually the most successful series in the history of Sci-Fi Network. It's a very fun action comedy sci-fi that's filmed in Toronto and Montreal. And Sci-Fi's original description of the show reads like this. After saving the life of the president, two Secret Service agents find themselves abruptly transferred to Warehouse 13, a massive top-secret storage facility in windswept South Dakota that houses every strange artifact, mysterious relic, fantastical object, and supernatural souvenir ever collected by the U.S. government. The warehouse's caretaker, Artie, played by Saul Rubinek, charges Pete, Eddie McClintock, and Micah, Joanne Kelly, with chasing down reports of supernatural and paranormal activity in search of new objects to cache at the warehouse, as well as helping him to control the warehouse itself. Alison Scagliotti, playing Claudia Donovan, joined the cast partway through Season 1 and became a series regular at the start of Season 2. CCH Pounder plays the delightfully mysterious Irene Frederick, and the cast is completed by Janelle Williams, who plays Lena. On the writing side, Warehouse 13, as a pilot, had a lot of hands in it, and Jack Kenny will tell you a little bit more about that, but uh, Rock Neil Bannon, uh, best known for Farscape, and uh, Jane Espenson, and uh, D. Brent Moat were all names that were associated with the pilot, and uh, coming on board after the pilot, and staying since then, is ex executive producer and showrunner Jack Kenny. He uh, took over the show and has been running it ever since. Its first season broke records for sci-fi, averaging over 4 million viewers. It's well into its second season and continuing to impress, so much so that uh, we're pretty confident that it's going to be picked up for a third season. Sci-fi hasn't said anything yet, but uh, they'd be fools not to. Um, of particular interest to the TV Writer Podcast is a recent crossover episode where storylines and characters crossed over from another sci-fi show called Eureka. Both shows had a spike in the ratings, and the crossover ob obviously worked. I'm proof in the pudding, because I actually was a Eureka fan before this and never had heard of Warehouse 13, and since then have totally caught up on the show, and I'm loving it. And I know there's uh, the numbers show that there's quite a few other people who are in the same boat. So I thought for the TV Writer Podcast, this is an interesting topic to pursue, because other shows might be in a similar opportunity, and we should always be open to... Um, thinking outside the box. So uh, we're going to talk to uh, Warehouse 13 showrunner Jack Kenny today. And next podcast, we're going to talk to Ian Stokes, who was the writer who actually penned that particular crossover episode. And coming up in the series, we're also going to be talking to Eureka showrunner Jamie Paglia. So it's a special privilege that we're going to be able to talk to executive producer and showrunner Jack Kenny. And part two in our next podcast will feature Ian Stokes, who was the writer of the uh, Warehouse 13 side of the crossover. Then in the next part of the series, we're going to talk to Eureka showrunner Jamie Paglia, and then also to Neil Grayston, who plays Douglas Fargo on Eureka, who was the actor who came over from Eureka to Warehouse 13. So stick around after the show. 
Uh, I'm going to give you some detail about how you can contact these writers and other writers, and so you don't want to miss that. But right now, we're going to move on to the very fun interview I had with Jack Kinney. Enjoy. This is great, and I'm here with Jack Kenny, the showrunner and executive producer of Warehouse 13. How are you doing, Jack? Good, Gray. How are you? I'm doing really, really well. I, I'm honestly just uh, so tickled that you could take the time to, to speak to me. I'm I'm really big fan of your show, though I have to say a very new fan. I, I only got started at the crossover episode. I, I was a fan of Eureka, oh. and I literally, even though... Uh, Warehouse 13 is shot in Toronto. My my wife actually is a background actor. She was on one of the shows. And, oh, uh, really? And I had never watched it until I saw that crossover episode. You didn't watch your wife's episode? <laughs> no. I mean, she's, wow. on so, she's on so many things. That's a problem. Yeah. But uh, but then I, I caught up really quickly, and I just love it. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah. And so I, we'll get to Warehouse 13 a little bit later, but this is uh, the TV Writer Podcast. And so I'd love to hear a little bit about your your past, like how you got into writing. I mean, you started out, you went to Juilliard. I did. I started out as an actor. Um, I you know, had a lot of plays in high school. Uh, went to the Juilliard Theater Center um, and got a degree, well, such as it is, a degree in acting. And uh, I acted for many years. I acted for about 13 years. I was uh, in John Houseman's acting company and uh, did uh, a couple of Broadway plays, a couple of some, several off-Broadway plays, a lot of regional theater. Uh, I was in the uh, 25th anniversary production of Fiddler on the Roof with Topol. I was mm-hmm. uh, Model the Tailor. Yeah. So I did a lot of that. And then I uh, moved to L.A. in uh, 91, and um, I uh, uh, started doing a lot of TV acting out here, and I was just, I was really bored. Because uh, acting in TV and films is a lot of sitting around and waiting, mm-hmm. waiting for the phone to ring, waiting for your scene to come up, waiting for them to light. And so I just started writing. I just, you know, I thought, well, I can, I can certainly write this stuff. And I started writing sitcoms, uh, specs. And um, and ended up uh, running into an old friend of mine from from Juilliard, Brian Hargrove, who was a year ahead of me, who's also out here writing. And uh, we decided to team up and um, started uh, you know writing scripts. You know, just spent every day. We spent four or five hours a day just writing, working on our spec scripts. We ended up getting a job on Dave's World, mm-hmm. and that's kind of when I walked away from acting. Uh, got the got the writing gig on Dave's World, and uh, moved from that to Caroline in the City, and then a few other shows. And then uh, Brian had always said that he was going to be uh, he was going to be done at fifty. He said he would he would uh, uh, quit writing at fifty. So uh, he lasted to fifty two, which I thought was pretty good. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then he decided, you know, he was uh, he was rich enough and didn't need didn't need to do this anymore. And so I wrote Book of Daniel on my own, just as a uh, sample uh, mm-hmm. to have a, a sample of my own work uh, as a solo writer. And Kevin Riley at NBC ended up buying it, and so all of a sudden I was an hour long writer. Wow. And it was the short-lived and controversial book of Daniel. It, it lasted what four weeks? Uh, four episodes. They aired uh, two episodes the first week, mm-hmm. uh, and then uh, two more episodes the subsequent two weeks, and uh, that was it. It was mostly because uh, uh, the uh, the right wing, uh, you know, the religious right wing, was very powerful mm-hmm. in 2006, and um, they uh, didn't like the idea that Jesus was a character in the show, mm-hmm. even though he was very loving and tolerant and uh you know uh didn't you know didn't dispense advice he was just there for daniel to talk to but mm-hmm. they were not big fans of him being on tv at all and they were certainly not fans of a gay man writing about him mm-hmm. i got a lot of a lot of flack about that and um and uh i actually had one person one person interview even said my jesus isn't tolerant <laughs> <laughs> so i thought that's a really oh, interesting my. version of jesus you have yeah. honey um, but wow. uh, it's a shame because I thought it was a I thought it was a really beautiful show and beautiful wonderful work by Aidan Quinn just mm-hmm. stunning cast uh, Ellen Burstyn and uh, James Rebhorn and just just one great actor after another and um, uh, but they came out in force against the show two weeks before we premiered uh, they 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 heard about the show and they just started boycotting and they had this huge letter writing campaign and they went after NBC and they went out after anybody who advertised so we couldn't get any advertisers. So and then uh, NBC got scared and put it on Friday night at ten o'clock, when you know the show was never going to work Friday night at ten o'clock, and um, and that was that. We had eight episodes. We shot eight episodes, and the DVD is mm-hmm. out. It's honestly the, the shows just got so great that our shows were better and better. The ones that didn't air were our best ones. But wow. 
you know, that's uh, that's showbiz, as they say. So, so you and, were co-writing for for most of that time. This was your first time. Yeah, that solo? was my first solo. Uh, my first solo outing uh, was Book of Daniel in two. I guess I wrote it in two thousand four. It got shot mm-hmm. in two thousand five, and started airing in the winter of oh uh, six. Mm-hmm. And um, been writing on my own since then. Well, and so how's it been writing on your own? Oh, I like it. I mean, I like working with a partner. I like writing on my own. I, I you know. Television is a very collaborative medium. Mm-hmm. It just is. You have to be collaborative to work in TV. And so working with a partner really taught me a lot about that, about listening to other people's opinions and taking, you know, the the, you know, the notes that you feel can be helpful to you. And, mm-hmm. and, and all, you know, also you're always you're collaborating with a studio and a network. I mean, it's all about collaboration. So you're never really writing alone. Even I know they say David, David Kelly writes all the scripts alone, but I know even David has help. <laughs> yeah. um, so, you know, everybody – there's no such thing as writing alone for TV, um, but uh, so so it was, it was useful in that regard. But I, but I do like you know it's nice not to have to necessarily answer to anyone. Mm. Um, but again, in television, you're always answering to somebody. But it's nice not to have to share the paychecks. Uh, yes, that that is the best <laughs> part. I didn't uh, I didn't think about that, but yes, that's uh, that's a huge advantage. I yeah. never minded that though. Yeah, you know, I never minded sharing my paycheck with Brian because Brian was you know. He was my partner. You know, mm-hmm. we we, uh, we we wrote really well together. I thought. Um, yeah. And uh, so I never minded that. That was never a problem for me. Well, and, I, and all the writing teams I know say that they they produce a lot of material very quickly. Yeah, you do work faster when you're in a team. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, what brought you from? Because that was it was released anyway in 2006. Uh, between Book of Daniel and Warehouse 13, how how did one lead to the other? Uh, well, I did Book of Daniel, and then I got, I, I was on a development deal at ABC Studios for a couple mm-hmm. years, um, and then the strike hit, and, uh, and things got ugly for a while. Um, I, I did, uh, I did work on a show called In Case of Emergency, my friend Howard Morris's show, which is a half hour sitcom for ABC. Mm-hmm. But then the strike hit, and we were all kind of, uh, unemployed for a while. Uh, and that was a rough time for everybody. And then, uh, when the writing work was slow to come back, so, and I had been, I had directed a lot of four camera stuff. I directed several episodes of Titus, mm-hmm. and a few episodes of it, which Titus was another show that Brian and I created uh, in uh, 2000. Uh, uh, very, I'm very proud of that show. It's also mm-hmm. out on DVD. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, so we did that. I directed a bunch of those. And I directed a bunch of Reba episodes and a, a pilot and a couple other things. And so I got hired to direct a, a bunch of episodes of a show called Roommates right mm-hmm. after the strike. So I worked as a director for a while. Um, and had a great time. And then, um, surreptitiously, uh, no, no, serendipitously, that's the uh-huh. word I'm looking for. Serendipitously, Eddie McClintock, who is an old friend of mine, I worked on a show called Holding the Baby. Oh, cool. That he was on. And, uh, he was doing, he was close friends with the guy who created Roommates, mm-hmm. the show I was directing. And he, Eddie came and did a guest spot on the show, and Eddie said to me, hey, my pilot got picked up. And I said, wow, wow, what pilot was that? And he said, this is a show called Warehouse 13. And I remembered, my friend David Simpkins, who ran the pilot, telling me about the show he was working on. I said, oh, i got to call David and congratulate him. So I just called him and said, hey, congratulations. And he said, yeah, they uh, they want to uh, want me to hire a showrunner. And I said, oh, well, hmm. <laughs> uh, so I got on the phone to my agent, and I said, uh, listen, I don't know much about this show, but from what I've heard, it sounds like it's more than you know your straightforward sci-fi show, so let me get a meeting. You know, Get, get me in there to meet them. Mm-hmm. So I watched the pilot, and I thought um, – Boy, this is, you know, this is, the thing that always frightened me away from uh, sci-fi was, uh, uh, you know, and I, and I know it was a wonderfully written show and a huge criti- critical success and has an enormous cult following. Mm-hmm. But Battlestar Galactica was always a title that scared me. Yeah. Because I, 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 yeah, I love Star Wars. I love Indiana Jones. I love Back to the Future. I love science fiction in general. But that sounded like wars and androids and you know i never checked it out because the title scared me mm-hmm. and i and i my my feeling was that when i saw warehouse 13 title aside i thought well this is way more than a sci-fi show yeah this is a show that can expand the the brand it can sp- expand the audience of the network because this has got a little of everything i, I refer to it as, as a thriller <laughs> because it's yeah. got a little bit of everything in it yeah and it's and, and it's good stuff and i said in my meeting with them i, I said a bunch of things i said you know you have the sci-fi audience. They're they're a loyal audience, and they'll, they'll always at least check out your shows. What you need to do is expand your brand to people like me, people who are interested in sci-fi but shy away from really, really strictly sci-fi stuff, yeah. really intense sci-fi stuff. And uh, there needs to be a young kid to deal with Artie. 
Um, <laughs> you know, it's great that Pete and Micah have these things, but if you don't have somebody for Audrey to deal with, he's going to be like Charlie of Charlie's Angels. Yeah. And just send them off on missions and sit there in that office. And Saul's such a terrific actor. Oh, he is. You need a, he needs a sorcerer's apprentice. And, and I think the comedy, because you have four, you know, the three at the time actors who are all really good at comedy mm-hmm. and can play those chops, I said, you really, you have to write to it. Yeah. You have to write to the relationship and the comedy and the family of it all because they form a really nice family. Mm-hmm. And, and, uh, I think that will broaden the audience because audiences like to laugh. Yeah. Yes, they love to be, you know, intense and, and, and focused and they like, they like to follow mysteries, but they also like to laugh. Mm-hmm. Oh, and Claudia was a wonderful addition. Yeah, she, uh, Allison's fantastic. Yeah. I actually directed Allison in a pilot when she was 13 called Joint Custody that, for the WWE. Oh, you're that, kidding. Yeah, it never went anywhere, but I'd known Allison for years, and uh, uh, two of the writers on the show, Ben Rabb and Derek Hughes, also knew knew her, and when we were looking for Claudia's, uh, we were initially looking for an Asian girl, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, they said, uh, do you know Allison? And I said, oh, yeah, I love Allison. I wanted her in Book of Daniel, but she was too young. Uh, we should, yeah, we should definitely bring her in, and we, I brought in Allison, and she... Uh, I, we, I talked to her before the audition and coached her a little bit, and and uh, and she wowed them, you know. Yeah, she yeah. Allison is a tremendous, tremendous addition, and she's she oh, yeah. is a stick in the works for Artie. That yeah. that it, like together she pushes his buttons, and you can bring out so much more in that character. Yeah. Well, that was always the uh, that was always the hope. Yeah. Was that she would that she would do that, you know, that she would that they would bounce off each other. And they do. And from 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 the from day one, they started uh, right right away. They were bouncing off each other. They were they they were uh, uh, made to work together. They're great. Yeah, and uh, and I do I do notice some subtle changes between the the pilot and uh, and the rest of the series. Um, in particular, the the Pete character, the way he comes across in in the the pilot, is much more, I guess, of a ladies' man. And mm-hmm. then um, in in the the body of the show, I think. You you took him down a little bit, which I think is good. It, he's able to play a little more w- with the group, not being so much of a loose cannon. Well, that note, I mean, you can you you, you can play that note of ladies' man just so far. I mean, you, you know, you want to do the same jokes every week. I mean, we do have him flirting with just about every pretty woman that walks onto the set. Mm-hmm. He's always flirting with somebody. And this season, he's already been he's been in bed with Tia Carrera and Paula Garces, mm-hmm. and uh, so he's. Um, He's definitely playing the field, and you know we wanted to see uh, what it will be like for Pete to actually fall for somebody. Mm-hmm. For, you know, for, and when we're going to do, you know, we have a nice arc for that relationship uh, coming up down the road that'll really be uh, really be wonderful for Eddie to play. And, and you know, I, it, it's it's fun to play the ladies' man. We always will. He'll always play the guy with the wandering eye. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's also it's also nice. You know, when you get a character like that, it's nice to see them knocked off their feet a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. But he's made out with a lot of women this year. He made out with Jamie Murray. He made out with Paula. He's made out with Tia. He's uh, he's doing okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, so going back to season one, season one broke records for sci-fi. Um, yeah. I mean, you you had the, this. I think four point four million with DVR numbers, the biggest airing ever for sci-fi, um, and uh, and so it it was a hit. I mean, I. I could even go as far as to say you're you're the flagship show on on sci-fi. I think I think that's true, and I think uh, you know a great a great deal of that success goes, of course, to sci-fi. For I mean, they promoted this series like no other series I've ever worked on. They really got behind it, and that that's uh, that's what these days that's what any network has to do in order to create a hit. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, you have to. I think we provided them with great material, and then they really took it. And, and ran it into the, ran it into the end zone. I mean, they, they, they promoted it right. They rebranded the network on our night and they have, they have stuck with the show, uh, promoting it like crazy this season as well. And, um, what was interesting is our, our numbers are a little lower this year, but I think that's because last year, Tuesday night was pretty much, uh, open territory. There was, I think we were kind of one of the only games in town on Tuesday mm-hmm. night. And this year, everybody's on Tuesday night. Yeah, every cable channel has a new series at nine o'clock on Tuesday night. Even even USA, our sister network, programmed White Collar opposite us. Wow! So so they've made it a much more competitive night, and we still, I feel like we're still holding our own this year. You know, all that considered, we're doing we're doing darn well. Well, especially with the DVR numbers. 
you know, DVO, the live plus sevens really, really come up. And, and unfortunately, that's all they ever measure. They only measure plus seven days. Yeah. And, and I've still got, my gosh, I've got episodes on my, on my TiVo downstairs from weeks and weeks ago oh, that I'm catching me. up on. Yeah. Yeah. So unfortunately, they never count any of that. They never count people who TiVo an entire series and then watch it later. They only count it if you've watched it within the next week. Mm-hmm. You know, many times I don't do that. I'm about four episodes behind on Project Runway. Yeah. So, um, you know, I never, never catch up. Yeah. So, so talk a little bit about, um, obviously it happens in every show that between season one and season two, the writers just know the characters better. The actors know the characters better. You can just sort of stretch your legs a little bit. But um, how, how has this, the experience been different season two versus season one? Um, well, uh, you're right in all your assessments. Everybody knows the show better. And that includes sci-fi. Mm-hmm. Um, we've had a, we've had a really, uh, uh, wonderful season with sci-fi this year. They've been incredibly helpful. And at, at the same time, they've also kind of let us, uh, you know, uh, uh, feel our oats and, and, and ride this as far as we could on our own. Um, last year, you know, we, we wrapped the season before anything even aired. So it was all, hypothetical it was mm. all well we think this will work and we think the audience will like this but we didn't know so we were trying a lot of different things and one of the things we found last year is that, that this show lives in many different areas this show lives in a way that we can do an episode like around the bend where pete's hallucinating and mm. on, and in danger and the very you know next week we can do uh, i mean and, and the previous week to that was uh, 13.1 which is kind of a, a romp yeah um and we can, I mean, there's always danger and stakes, but the tenor of each episode changes and every, there doesn't seem to really be a formula. We can pretty much do uh, anything we want, go from very, very serious high drama to, uh, uh, you know, uh, screwball comedy, uh, week to week. So it was one of the things we learned. And then, yeah, everybody, everybody kind of knows their characters really well. And I think the success of any TV show comes from the actors becoming those characters or rather mm-hmm. bringing who they are to the roles. And so we've actually been writing the characters more like Eddie and Saul and Joanne and Allison. We've mm-hmm. been writing them like those guys, you know, in their in their um, in their wheelhouse. So if Allison plays the guitar, Claudia plays the guitar. If Eddie was a wrestler, and, and then 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 uh, Pete was a wrestler, mm-hmm. and we just write in, and, and it's just it's more fun for the actors to play, and they bring a depth to it that that you don't always get if you just add something. Yeah, you know. So so everybody knows everything a lot better, and that includes production too. Or, our, our production designer, Franco Dakotas, is an absolute genius. Oh, I, I mean, those I, shows are stunning. stunning. Oh, I know, and it's all and it's it's Franco. I mean, we do a movie every week because, yep. unlike most shows, uh, most we're, we have eight days to shoot, which is uh, less than most network shows, but about average for cable. Mm-hmm. But uh, seven of those days, we're on location, wow. which is really unusual for a, an episodic television show. Mm-hmm. Usually, they're, usually they're in the studio for six days and then on, on location for maybe two days. Yeah, but we're out seven, six or seven out of eight days every single episode, and and it's it's exhausting and it and it beats up the crew, but it also excites everybody, including the crew, because we're we are shooting a movie uh, every week. Yeah. So now on to the crossover. Um, yes. Brilliant idea. Obviously, I'm 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 proof in the pudding. <laughs> I mean, it converted yeah. <laughs> me. Um, and both Eureka and Warehouse Thirteen had a big spike. Uh, when, I mean, I, big might be a strong, but a spike. In, no, we did very well. Yeah, in uh, in the ratings in in those crossover episodes, how how did the idea come about to to cross these shows together? Well, um, actually, I I think Jamie and I ran into each other at Comic Con last year, and talked about it, and it sort of took off from there, uh, because we realized that our two shows actually could exist in the same universe. Mm-hmm. I mean, we couldn't really do it with uh, you know Ghost Hunters. Uh, yeah. Or, I mean, you know, we couldn't do it with Caprica mm. or, or something like that. That wouldn't work. An actor can guest star, but we can't, we can't cross a character. Yeah. But we realized that Eureka and Warehouse live in the same universe, mm-hmm. in the same, the same world, and we could easily, uh, you know, do the crossover. And also, we knew that Neil and Allison knew each other and were uh, BFFs. Oh, you know? cool. Yeah, they got along really, really well. They were very, very good friends from the get-go, and so we knew that it would be absolute you know pleasure to have both of them around neil is a neil is a delight to have on any set mm-hmm. 
and uh, they got along great, and we all had fun doing it. So I think you know I'd love to I'd love to do another one next year, and maybe even cross over a couple of characters. Yeah. Um, because it's just it's just you know it just seems to work. You know, we're all in the same world. I I haven't actually been following Haven, but my guess is uh, we could probably cross over with Haven as well. Yeah. Well, the the interesting thing is is uh, is how much they can complement each other because uh, you, they have a very very similar tone. Um, Right, but at, but at the same time, and 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 very similar in the idea that um, there's hi- something hidden. So in right. theirs, it's it's hidden science. Here, it's hidden artifacts. Well, there's science, and we're fiction. Yeah, I mean, you know, we uh, we get to do. Uh, they do a lot of science, and we do a lot of of uh, history. Really. Mm-hmm. There's a lot. There's a lot of there's a lot of uh, 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 antiquity in our show, and and we. You know, all all of our stuff we do a lot of research to make uh, to to make it feel as real as 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 it can possibly be. Um, but I think yeah, I think the shows you know they they they're enough they have enough in common that a crossover doesn't seem uh, bumpy or or like it's you know just done for promotion. Mm-hmm. It actually feels like it makes sense. Yeah, you know. And so so you are looking forward to uh, to to more next year. I know I know there's going to be a lot of really excited people about that. Oh, I'd love to, I'd love to do that. I'm, I'm I'm a good friend with good friends with Colin Ferguson. I've known him for years. We mm-hmm. actually I actually acted on a, a sitcom that he was a, a, a lead on uh, years ago called um, Then Came You. Oh, cool. I was I was doing Punch Up for this show, and my friend Jeff Strauss had created it, and and I was showing that you know we were talking about this actor who was playing this character, and I said he really needs to play it more like this. This is what's funny about it. And Jeff said, "Well, do you want to do it?" And I said, "No, I, I got, I just started Titus." <laughs> and uh, Jeff talked me into it, and we ended up working on. I ended up doing uh, five or six episodes of Then Came You with Colin, and Colin was uh, one of the leads on it, so we got to be good pals. And so I would love to have uh, um, Sheriff Carter come over to Warehouse 13 next year. I think that'd be fun. Oh, that'd be great. I think he and Artie would get some major spike uh, sparks flying. Yeah. Now, now, just logistically, in terms of um, crossing over, uh, did you did your staffs meet, or or just the writers who are writing those crossover episodes, or how did how did that work out? Well, I sat down. Uh, uh, Ian Stokes, who wrote that episode and who uh, knows Eureka inside and out because he worked at Sci Fi for two years. Oh, okay. So he he knows uh, Eureka very very well. He knows the characters. He and I sat down with uh, Jamie Paglia, Bruce Miller, and. Uh, Paula Yu, who wrote uh, their crossover episode, mm-hmm. and we just talked about, uh, you know, what would be fun, what, what we were planning on doing, what they were planning on doing. We didn't really, I mean, we, we sent each other drafts for approval and if there was anything that felt out of character, but it wasn't really, um, we were just informing each other, and we got along great during the process. It was a really easy process, and Jamie's such a wonderful guy, I and mean, he's just mm-hmm. a... I met him at Comic Con last year, and and we got along really well. And I I just think he's terrific and very so smart and and funny and charming. And and it was just a joy to be able to work with him. And Bruce Miller's great, and Paul is great. We just you know we just all really got along. Yeah, well, that it, it's it's honestly it's fun, and uh, I think networks should take note. I mean, what a great way to uh, to cross pollinate. Yeah, it really is fun, and it and it makes sense, you know. So we uh, we had had it. We had also had a. A phone conversation in, in the episode between between uh, Artie and uh, Sheriff Carter, but it, uh, it it fell by the wayside for length of. We didn't shoot it; it was just the episode yeah. was too long. Yeah, and we figured we'll do it next year. Yeah, well, let's let's talk about your staff a little bit. Um, I was chatting with uh, Nell Scovell the other night, and she told me that um, that you have a really fun staff. We do. We we get like we, you know that's kind of what I like to do. Um, it's showing her. I, I like to make sure that. That people, you know, the, the showrunner job is, is as much about diplomacy and parenting mm-hmm. as as anything else. It's it's making sure the family gets along, intervening when there's a an argument or or a, or a disruption, and keeping uh, you know keep every, keeping everybody happy. And um and this is a pretty happy staff. I mean, everybody's pretty excited to be on the show. Uh, you know, everybody everybody likes what they do, and pretty much everybody gets along and like each other. And we're all working in television at a very difficult time uh, in the economy and the business. So why wouldn't we be happy? <laughs> and we're working on a hit show that we all like. You yeah. know, it's all a show that we enjoy watching, which is not something you can always say in your career. Uh, you can't always say you enjoy watching the show you're working on, um, but uh, we all do. And and I think it's it's just it's a testament to everybody on the staff that we all there's a lot of respect, a lot of mutual respect for each other, and. And uh, we all try to, you know, everybody's very helpful of each other. And I always, I'm also very much, uh, 
I like to make sure every writer gets their due. Cause, you know, a lot of showrunners put their name on every script in some place or another. And I always feel like, mm, you know, every showrunner does do, does rewrite every script. It's because that's the job. That's sort of the job description is the writer hands in a draft and then you have to do a pass on it because the showrunner is what makes any show consistent mm-hmm. is to, you know, to keep it. And obviously as the show goes on over the years, you like to do less and less work on it because everybody's getting the tenor of the show better and better. Uh, but I always feel like, you know, writers, uh, need to ha- need to feel a sense of ownership over their scripts. So I, I like to make sure that they get the credit where the credit is due. You know, they wrote the script, they came up with the idea. So that's great. That's great. And, uh, now, um, it's, uh, another, another show that I do a podcast for is Chuck and, and their writing rooms are literally down the hall from the editing rooms, which are just a golf cart drive away from the set. Um, you're, writing in LA and shooting in Toronto. How is that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's exhausting is what it is. It's, yeah. um, I mean, the uh, post-production, well, they used to be in our offices. Now they're across the lot. I, I still rather they were down the hall because mm-hmm. that makes life a lot easier. But, you know, it's hard. It's, uh, it's, it's not an easy thing. I, you know, I, I miss being home. I, I miss my, my, uh, my other half. I miss my house, my dog. Um, you know, it's tough being in Toronto, but I feel like it's really important that, uh, I'm on the set a lot or somebody or one of the writers or both of us is on the set as much as possible because you come up with things in the moment. You know, mm-hmm. we're, we're, we keep consistent with the show. The actors feel like they're, they're, uh, they have a safety net. People are more willing to try stuff and question things. If there's something that's a question, you know, if, if nobody's on the set, you know, the actor will just pretty much say what's on the page. And, you know, if they have a question about it, they might not raise it because there's mm-hmm. nobody there to raise it to. Yeah. So it's, it's, I think it's really important. I think it's one of the reasons the show is successful is that, you know, we've had such a, a strong hand in actual production. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it makes it a little harder to, to have a life, but, uh, it's only six months out yeah. of the year. So I can, I can live with that. Yeah. And so, so say, for instance, if Ian is writing an episode, he'll actually come to Toronto for the shooting of his episode or how will that work? Yeah. This, I mean, the, uh, yes, the writer, the writer almost always comes up to Toronto for their episode. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes I'm there with them. Sometimes they're on their own. But, uh, yeah, there's always, there's always somebody there, uh, from the writer's office to, uh, you know, just, keep a handle on everything mm-hmm. and uh and so why toronto i mean of course the, the the pilot was was shot here and you have the existing locations but can you just talk briefly about why not vancouver why not la what's what's well, particular about toronto i, I like us i'm in toronto so that's great oh no, yeah for us, but... i think i think uh, the advantage of shooting in toronto for us is uh, uh because we're a location show because we take place you know our, our show tries, tries to go all over the world uh, Toronto can be made to look like more cities than Vancouver or, or LA. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, obviously it would be fun to shoot in LA because I'd be home, but, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, if we had to shoot somewhere, I'm glad it's Toronto because it's, it doesn't have the troubles of New York. It doesn't have the, the per, you know, the permit issues and the, uh, the, you know, crazy traffic and, you know, the, mm-hmm. the crazy insanity of New York. And yet it has, um, a, a variety of locations. We can shoot, uh, you know, places to look like almost anywhere. We've shot Egypt, we've shot China, we've shot, uh, uh, Russia, France, England. Um, you know, I, we'll, I'm sure we'll end up in South America at some point for an episode. We, we, we can pretty much make it look like any place we need it to look like. And that's the advantage. So mm-hmm. that's, that's, that, that's to me, I think the main reason we shoot the show in Toronto. It's a great place to find crew too. You get really talented, uh, talented people up there. Our, our wardrobe, uh, designer, uh, Joanne Hansen mm-hmm. is Toronto. Franco Dakota is our production designer. You know, everybody, all these want to, Kara Sprell, who does all the props. Um, you know, we get some great people up there. Yeah. Saul must like it. He's uh, Canadian. Yeah. Saul's Canadian. Joanne's Canadian. Mm-hmm. We've had several Canadian guest stars this year. I mean, from the States, actually. Zach Ward, mm-hmm. who was in the crossover episode. Uh, he played Leo, the guy behind the counter mm-hmm. in the crossover. He was actually in Titus with me. Oh, cool. Yeah, and Zach was in uh, a Christmas story. He was um, the bully. Um, oh, okay. Shoot, I can't think of it. I can't think of the bully's name now. But he still gets recognized in airports. <laughs> and he still looks like the kid in Christmas story. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Very cool. So, uh, so uh, we're getting towards the end. There's a couple, a couple more things. One is um, sort of more general questions about writing, and then also just a few fan questions. But first. I know people would shoot me if I didn't ask what can we expect to see toward the end of the season and also looking towards season three. 
Well, we have a big uh, we have a big arc uh, coming up with H.G. Wells. Uh, that story is coming to a head at the end of the season, mm-hmm. and we'll get to see uh, Warehouse Two, the, which was the lost warehouse. It was uh, in uh, in Alexandria in Egypt, wow. and we're going to do we're going to get to see that, and um, we'll get to see uh, Lindsay Wagner again. Great, she's coming back, and uh, and as I said as I said, H.G. Wells will be back, and uh, we're going to. Uh, um, do something with Pete's uh, story with Paula Garces. So we, and, and also uh, there's a really cool um, uh, story with Claudia and Todd next week, uh, next Tuesday night in an episode called Vendetta. The, the Claudia Todd relationship comes to a head. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, so we've got some really cool stuff planned for all the relationships, and we have some great artifacts. We learn a lot about Artie's past mm-hmm. next week in the episode Vendetta, um, and then uh, in. Uh, and the following week, we have a time travel episode where they go, where Pete and Micah go back to 1961. Oh, cool. And we get to see uh, what the warehouse was like in 1961 and uh, they're hunting an artifact. So I actually there's a character that's back from next year. Uh, Roberta Maxwell plays Rebecca, uh, an old warehouse agent. She's back uh, next week in the, the week after next episode. Uh, it's called Where and When. Mm-hmm. So we've got some really fun stuff planned for the season. Next season, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I will start. We will start thinking about that on November second. Yeah, that's when we start working on next season, and uh, we're leaving a, a bunch of untied uh, knots uh, at the end of this season, just like we did last year, and we'll have to tie them up next year and then move forward. Oh, that's uh, great. That's great. Now you guys haven't been officially renewed, but I can't imagine. I mean, what? <laughs> yeah, I think it has all to do with quarters and when GE does their business and stuff yeah. like that. We're, I think we're back. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, it, I mean, if you're, if you've got the numbers, why wouldn't they? I'm planning on it. So. Yeah. <laughs> so, so a few fan questions. One from the UK, um, a UK Cats fan, nineteen ninety eight asks, um, are isn't is a twenty two episode season in the in the cards? You know, I doubt that it is because. Um, uh, I mean, they're still talking about how many will be picked up for next year. There's, 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 you know, discussions about how many episodes to do. And sometimes the sci-fi model is to do uh, ten in in the summer and ten in the winter. Mm-hmm. But I'm not sure that that's what they're going to do. I don't, I don't. I, I think 22 episodes would kill me, <laughs> and I think it would yeah. kill our crew. Yeah. Because of all the things I was saying in terms of in terms of the fact that we are actually shooting a movie every week. I don't. I don't think we could physically do 22 episodes a year, mm-hmm. um, which is the reason the show looks so good is because we do episodes the way we do. Yeah. Uh, I think we could conceivably do maybe 16, but I don't know if that's financially the model. The problem I'm having, I mean, I'm disappointed this year because uh, like we did last season, our last two or three episodes are going to go crashing into the fall network season. Mm-hmm. So I'm worried that a lot of people aren't going to see our last couple of episodes uh, especially our season finale, because they're all going to be watching uh, um, uh, the network shows that start. There's new shows and season premieres that happen on Tuesday night the 21st. So we're going to lose a lot of our audience to that. So if we were to shoot more than that, I wouldn't want to go further into the season. They'd, we'd have to split it up. Yeah. And then you got to talk about launching, you know, twice a year rather than just once a year. Right. And launching a season is always very expensive. So there's a lot of factors that go into play. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, it's good to know those factors. I, I, yeah. I know for a lot of people, it's just I want more. <laughs> but, yeah, and, and and we'd love to give you more. It's uh, it becomes it comes down to dollars and cents and time. Yeah, and quality. Mm-hmm. And Hoopy uh, double H double O double P double Y asks: um, Is there ever going to be a mention of the Claudio Fargo thing on either show? Um, I think sp- speaking not just about crossover, but their relationship. Um, well, they didn't really. Uh, they didn't really uh, uh, bring their relationship to fruition, mm-hmm. as it were. Um, we we haven't been playing it because it can sometimes feel unsatisfying to just talk about something. Right. It feels like a radio play when you talk about a, a something that happens off camera that you don't get to see anything of it. So we probably won't play that. As I say, we're gonna we're gonna bring the Claudia Todd relationship to a bit of a head, mm-hmm. and uh, then after that, we're into the major uh, arc of the end of the season. But like I say, I, I sure would like to bring Neil back next year. And, uh, I mean, logistically it's tough because we shoot at the same schedule. We were able to do it this year because Neil was light in an episode. And then Claude, we, we had a two week hiatus during which Allison went to Vancouver and shot her episode. But ordinarily it, it's hard. I, I, as much as I, I say I want to get Colin to come over and do our show, I know that that would be a very tough schedule for him because yeah. he's in almost every scene. Yeah. And it would just be hard to for them to free him up for any amount of time. Mm-hmm. 
And uh, we have three questions from Lou, also known as Old Darth on Twitter. Um, he asks, on the Warehouse 13 website, you've mapped out the history of the warehouses. How much of that are we going to see on screen? You mentioned about Warehouse 2, but um, are there Yeah, this year we're only seeing, hearing about Warehouse 2. Uh, next year, maybe we'll learn about another warehouse. I, I, uh, I found myself up late one night in Toronto and unable to sleep, so I decided to start writing out uh, all the histories <laughs> of the warehouses. I just sat down with uh, Google and Wikipedia and started hunting and and finding I, what I'm going to do during the hiatus is expand on that history a little bit more oh, great. Uh, for the website. Uh, and then, you know, as we expand it, we find ways to incorporate it into episodes. It's it's hard because, um, you know, it, again, it becomes it becomes talking about something. I mean, we're able to actually go to Warehouse Two mm -hmm. uh, in this episode coming up, the next to the last episode. But it's it's that episode almost killed everybody. Wow! Because it's all virtual sets and mm -hmm. a lot of green screen, and that's always twice as much work, especially when you're you you know you're doing the location stuff. And it was just uh, it was just a real killer episode. It looks great, but I don't I don't think we could do more than one of those a season without you know. But as it as it was, our director, the last day of that episode, Steve Sergic, our producing director, who was directing that episode, uh -huh. got slammed with appendicitis and went to the hospital. And, oh my goodness! And uh, Mike McMurray, the DP, and I finished out the day wow. finishing that episode. So it was uh, it, 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 it's a it's a it's a tough show. We we work really 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 hard. Sometimes mm -hmm. 16, 17, a couple of nineteen hour days. Wow. And uh, next question is, uh, where did the idea to have H.G. Wells a female come from? And why? Um, you know, I don't remember uh, specifically who pitched what. I tend to not do that because I never like to give um, – uh, well, I certainly don't like to take credit. And uh, so if it's something I pitched, I'll never say so. Hmm. Um, but I think, you know, everything we come up with in the room, it, it, a lot of times they're what I call assists. You know, somebody will say, what about Charles Dickens? And somebody will say, that's cool. Well, what about H.G. Wells? And, and somebody will say, that, hey, what if H.G. Uh, Wells was uh, not what we expected? What if H.G. Wells was uh, was black? Mm -hmm. Or what if H.G. Wells was a woman? You know, and things get batted around the room, and all of a sudden you've got an idea on the board. And it's the writer's assistant's job to keep keep track of all that and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and pay attention to when I go, yeah, I like that. Let's do that. <laughs> and we end up doing that. But, um, I, you know, every I consider – Everything we do on Warehouse 13, a group effort. Yeah, I have a yeah. tremendously talented writing staff, and and everybody contributes something, uh, if not if not many many things. So I never like to like split up the staff that way. Mm -hmm. And uh, are we ever going to see the Lost Ark of the Covenant? <laughs> I don't think Steven Spielberg will let us. <laughs> Uh, no, I don't think we'll see that because that kind of belongs to Indiana Jones. Yeah. Um, but we'll see other cool stuff. Yeah. Oh, we're, sure. we're, gonna, we're putting up shelves in the office this year. We're going to start bringing in things that we think could be artifacts and putting them <laughs> on the shelves for inspiration. Very, very cool. Um, so moving on to just a few writing questions. Of course, this is the TV Writer Podcast. Um, are there any particular writing books that you would recommend to new writers and particularly for writing and television? Oh gosh, I've never read a writing book. Uh, oh, no. If you're a writer, if you're a writer, write. Just yeah. just write, write, write. Give your scripts to people that you that you respect, and and listen to what they have to say, and take what you agree with and discard what you don't agree with. But write. Always be writing. Always, always, always be writing. Yeah. Because writing is rewriting. You're never finished. It's never finished until it's in foreign release. Mm hmm. And and when when you're when you in particular are hiring, um, what what do you look for? In writers that you're hiring, well, um, you know, obviously, I, I read the scripts and, and and to see if they, you know, if uh, how they how they handle the characters and how they handle dialogue and is it an interesting story that takes me by surprise. I'm more interested in story than I am in dialogue because you never know, you know, when you get a script, you never know who's helped who with what. Hmm. But generally, the original idea is the writers. So I remember I read a Larry Sanders spec once, and um, the opening scene was. Uh, Larry waking up in bed next to a woman and she's dead. And I just thought, you know, that's a brilliant idea. Yeah. I don't know if they ever did it. I don't know who, I don't remember who wrote it, but I remember I met with that writer because I don't care what happens in the rest of the script. The, the, it'll be rewritten and rewritten by the staff anyway. Hmm. But that's a great, that you put, you take a character like Larry Sanders and you put him in a situation like that, it's going to be funny. Wow. And so, you know, you look for, I look for a good idea. And then the next thing I look for is I meet with the writer and I see if they play well with others. Mm -hmm. You know, do they seem like they'll get along? Cause you're building a family and, and, and you have to, you have to put people together who, 
respect each other and and listen to each other and 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 want to contribute rather than want to want to be a star. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And uh, and do you have any preference for original material or 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 TV specs? Um, I tend to like original material because uh, uh, you know unless unless it's a show I know and love. You know, it's a it's it's a double edged sword. If it's a show I know and love, uh, it had better be damn good. Mm -hmm. uh, just to live up to that show. And if it's a show I don't know, I'm going to have trouble reading it. So I prefer reading original pilots. Yeah. Well, that's all I have. And I really, Great. really appreciate you taking the time. Oh, actually, one other thing I'd, I'd like to ask is if you have any, any projects you'd like me to promote for you, anything you're doing in the break? No, I'm not doing a damn. I'm 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 power washing my patio. That's all I'm doing in the break. So no, you don't have to you don't have to promote anything for me. But thank you. Cool. I appreciate it. Well, I really appreciate appreciate you taking this time, and I really appreciate you giving us a great show. I just love this show, and uh, and I think if anybody's listening to this podcast and and hasn't checked it out, they would do well to check it out. And also, you mentioned a couple other DVDs that are for sale of past work you've done. <laughs> Oh, thanks. I appreciate that. And yeah, please check out Warehouse 13. It, it, there's something for everybody. And, and I think if you watch a couple episodes, you'll be hooked. Yeah, I think so. I certainly was. And uh, and so great, great job. Thanks very much. Yeah. So Well, I'll see you in Toronto, maybe. Yeah, maybe. That'd be great. Stop by the set sometime. Yeah, I will. Okay. Thanks, Greg. Okay. Thanks so much, Jack. Bye. Bye-bye. And we're back. I super appreciate Jack Kenny taking the time. Uh, he's just a great guy to talk to. Uh, we were on the phone for a good 45 minutes, and I really appreciate him uh, taking the time out of his schedule to to do that and to share with us uh, a lot of things that I'm sure will be helpful to you. Um, you know that getting a job at this business is usually about who you know. Uh, I, I don't use my resume anywhere near as much as I used to. Most of the jobs that I get now are through word of mouth, the people that I know. And even the best writing can't help if you can't get your writing into the right hands. So it's because of that that I had the idea um, that I want to start a Twitter database of uh, TV writers that are on Twitter. Uh, so far, I've got about 140 names and Twitter handles, and I'm going to be compiling that into a handy resource on the tvwriterpodcast.com website. So you would do well to check it out. I may have it up by the time this podcast is released. But certainly over the next few days, come back to the site and you'll see there's already a, a, a page for it where you can see some of the writers that I have. And uh, and it my hope for that is that it's going to be a, a great resource for people to get connected with other writers. Um, as I mentioned in my interview with Jack Kenny, I, I just got, got connected with uh, Nell Scovell the other day. Um, we just connected on Twitter. We ended up chatting for an hour. Um, and you never know when that kind of thing is going to happen, where you connect with people that you had no idea you would connect with. I just got a tweet the other day from Stephen J. Cannell, who, of course, we know from just about everything that's ever been created in television. I speak about uh, The Greatest American Hero, The A-Team, and uh, about a hundred other shows. Um, just responded to a tweet <laughs> that I said. It's, it's really cool. If you're not on Twitter, you really should. Uh, get on Twitter. It's it's a great resource for networking, for getting connected. So watch tvwriterpodcast.com for that Twitter database and as well for lots of other things that I told you about in episode number one. Uh, in particular, though, um, right now in the podcast, if you're watching the video podcast, you'll see Twitter handles for all, uh, I believe all, of the Warehouse 13 writers. So if you'd like to follow these guys on Twitter, uh, you can just look at these handles here and follow them on Twitter. I'm sure they'd love for you to follow them and to hear from you. So as we close out, I want to remind you about what's coming up next. We're going to be talking to Warehouse 13 writer Ian Stokes, who wrote the crossover episode. And after that, the Eureka showrunner Jamie Paglia and actor Neil Grayston, who plays Douglas Fargo on Eureka. You can access the TV Writer Podcast at tvwriterpodcast.com. You can get it at tvwriterpodcast.blip.tv. You can get it at the scriptmag.com website. And you can get it from iTunes. All of those are video formats um, where there's information that you can see on the screen or on your iPod or on your iPhone. As well, there is an audio-only version that is very helpful when you're driving. And that is available at scriptmag.com or through the Script Magazine iTunes account. Thanks so much for watching or listening. And I hope that you send your thoughts to me at mail at tvwriterpodcast.com. You can follow me on Twitter 
at Gray Jones, G-R-A-Y-J-O-N-E-S. I'd love to hear from you on Twitter. Anyway, until next time, bye-bye. Hosted by Gray Jones, the TV Writer Podcast is brought to you by Script Magazine and ScriptMag.com, the leading source for script writing information in print and on the web. And by Final Draft Script Writing Software, the entertainment industry standard for script writing worldwide. Uh-huh.